So the first one up, Clayton, come on down. Amen. <clears throat> can you hear me? What about now? I didn't even, can y'all hear me? All right. Well, um, I know they said 25 minutes. Somebody keep a timer on me because uh, I would go over if you don't. Um, before I get started, I just want to kind of tell you where my mindset was last few days uh, about the power of God, about the power of the Holy Ghost, and why is there no power? And I'm not necessarily saying in here. I'm saying places that I've been throughout my life and messages I've heard, there was never no power in what they were saying. There was no power. Seen nothing happening. Absolutely nothing happening. It was either they was preaching a Jesus that didn't exist, a powerless Jesus that's not the Jesus of the Bible, or it was just, they. what was it? What, what, what was it? What was it? So then I start getting in the Word of God, and every time I read the Word of God, I examine myself. I don't examine anybody else. I examine me to the Word of God. So uh, I'm, I'll just leave it right there. Father God, we just thank you for this day. Lord, you give this Word. Lord, help me speak it. Lord, let the people receive it. It'd be all about you, Lord. It open our eyes to things that, that you're just trying to open our eyes to, Lord, that we glorify you in the things that we do, Lord. We praise you and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So, I'm going to start out reading a couple of verses, and then I'm going to take off. All right. Um, yeah, that's the way it works. Uh, John 13, John chapter 13. The reason I brought two Bibles up here is because if I start fumbling through this new Bible and can't find my place, I will go to the old one. You know something that's familiar? Yeah. Yes, just the other day, my wife is walking with my Bible down the hall, and I was like, where are you going with that? She said, it's time to retire. I said, no, it's not. I said, it's got everything in it that I've written and all this stuff, and she was trying to put it away because, you know, it looks a little rough. But uh, so I'm going to attempt to start getting in this other Bible that was bought for me a while back and start putting it to use and see if I can uh, go from one Bible to the other so maybe she can put it on a shelf. And I'll just go to it when I want to study every day. All right. Amen. I'll kind of I'll kind of give you an idea where I come from. When I grew up, Church Christ, I was raised in Church Christ. All I was told is when you're old enough and you decide to get baptized in water, you're good to go. That's how I was told. That was how the gospel was presented to me. That's how Jesus was presented to me. That when you were old enough to decide to get baptized in water. So uh, that happened when I was in uh, Sally Port over there at Cook County Jail uh, back in 2006. Um, that man that went in that water is the same one that come out. Uh, nothing had changed in my life. And then I started going to church. And they just, then these men, they would say, if you repeat this prayer after me, so I'd repeat that prayer after every single one of them. Every Because I wanted to make sure that it stuck, you know, because this is a different man telling me something different than the way I was raised. So I would do it. Nothing ever changed. Nothing changed in my heart. My actions didn't change. My thoughts didn't change. I did start going to church a little bit because I thought that's what you're supposed to do. But every time I'd go in there, and these are the same messages I'd hear every time. Uh, we've all done wrong. Jesus loves you just like you are. All you got to do is ask him in your heart. That was the same message that I hear on the radio now that I'm out of prison. It's the same message that I hear everywhere. The big churches I would go to two, two or three times a year before I got really born again and saved. It was the same message. So no power within it absolutely no power to change me. The Jesus that I was receiving wasn't changing me. And I come in here in 2012, it might have been January 2013, I'm not sure the exact date. It was uh, U-Turns first when they took this building over. And I, I come in here because my wife had beat my head in with a hammer and uh, on Thanksgiving and we, we promised our son that wouldn't come home, that we would go to church just so he would... Uh, come home. He was scared. You know, she went to jail, and then she he got to experience her whipping me pretty good, you know, and uh, left me. For, she wouldn't have cared if I would have died. But anyway, so I decided we'll come here. We live in apartments over there. 
well, you'll come here because it's real close to the house. So uh, we come over here, and I heard uh, Kevin Alexander get up here and preach. I thought he was the biggest liar I ever heard in my... I ain't kidding, because the things he was saying... What he was saying, what he was standing up here saying, didn't sound like what any other preacher had ever said to me. He was, it was like he was watching me in my bedroom. He was watching me in my living room, watching me in that truck going down the road. He knew everything that I was doing, and it was absolutely hurting me. And when I left out of here, I did not feel good about myself at all. I said, that guy's a liar because I've always felt good about myself every time I walked out of a church. Every time. I've never not felt good about myself when I left. So what did I do? I knew that just something told me that the Word of God was true. The Word of God was true and correct. So I was going to go to the Word of God because I knew it was real. Something within me told me this was the truth. But when I started getting in the Word of God and I started reading the Word of God, it just showed me that I didn't know the Jesus Christ of the Bible. I didn't know him at all. Now, I didn't know the Jesus Christ that said, pick up this cross daily, die to self. Pick it up, die to self daily. Pick it up and follow me. It wasn't, I didn't know that Jesus said, you got to partake of all of me. You got to eat of my flesh and drink of my blood. You got to partake of all of me. I didn't know none of that. I didn't know that Jesus said, repent, turn away from, from your sin or something else worse will come upon you. I didn't know that Jesus. I just knew the Jesus that was going to put me into heaven. But I didn't want that Jesus, that I, the one that was in the Bible. I didn't want holiness, righteousness, anything like that. I wanted to live like I always lived. That's why it was so appealing just to get baptized in water or repeat that prayer. The same as many of y'all had fallen trapped too. It's a false gospel. It's a false Jesus. There's no power within it. Um, this is not where I was going to go, but I've used this before. Um, the Jesus that I knew wasn't even as powerful as a banana. And I'm going to use this to draw a picture. Um, about five or six years ago, I lived in Jacksboro. After I'm truly born again and saved, I drive a truck for a living. Uh, had it parked beside the house. And, uh, I, you know, the, the evening before, my wife's like, hey, we're out of individual sandwich baggies. I'm like, it don't matter. Go ahead and just... Put them in a napkin, throw them in a Walmart sack, whatever. So that evening, she made me a ham and cheese sandwich and wrapped it up in a napkin, put it in that Walmart sack. She uh, took a brownie, uh, wrapped it in a napkin, put it in the same Walmart sack, and then she put a banana in that Walmart sack, tied it up, put it in the refrigerator. That was like 5, 6 o'clock in the evening. The next morning, 4 o'clock in the morning, I go in there, and I open up that refrigerator, and I grab that Walmart sack, and I can already see part of that brownie. So I'm already thinking, I'm going to eat that when I get in that truck. So, I, yeah, I go out there, start the truck up while it's building up air pressure or whatever, and I kick the tires, get in there, and uh, I reach down in that sack, and I grab that brownie. I pull it up toward my nose, and it smelled like a banana. I had to look, you know. I was like, that's the brownie. But it smelled like a banana. Didn't think nothing of it. I took a bite of it, and it tasted like that banana. Uh, kind of humored me, but I went ahead and eat it. I wouldn't let it go to waste. But that whole way through, it tasted and smelled like a banana. Okay, 15, 20 minutes later, I'm going down the road, and I'm already thinking about that ham and cheese sandwich. Yeah, my lunch never made it to lunch because then I wouldn't have a reason to stop later. So I reached down in that sack, and I grabbed that ham and cheese sandwich, and I pulled it up toward my nose, and I smelled a banana. And I said to myself, I was like, there ain't no way this is going to taste like a banana. But I took a bite out of that sandwich, and that ham and cheese sandwich tasted just like a banana. And it tasted and smelled like a banana the whole way through. And it's like it was speaking to me. You know, everything that goes on in my life, the Lord ministers something to me. It draws a picture, and I, I like preaching in prisons, and I, like, I preach to a lot of people that don't even have a seventh grade education, so I draw pictures, and I make them parallel with the Word of God, and God has gifted me in that way to show pictures, because just like anybody pick up a magazine, you ain't going to read no story unless it looks like a good picture, so I draw pictures. The, all right, so I started uh, going down the road a little bit, and the Lord just placed it in my spirit. He's like, just think. That banana 
was in that sack with that brownie and that ham and cheese sandwich just overnight, and already two of its characteristics had already changed. And you said that you were a Christian for 20-something years, and none of your characteristics have changed. You mean to tell me that a banana is more powerful than me? So I always tell people to examine yourself. I'm going to ask you right now to examine yourself. Has anything changed within your life since you've come to Christ? Has anything changed? And my message today was about the love of God. So I'll head jump over in there. Um, and let's see, where was I at? In John 13, 34. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men know that you are my disciples if you love one to another. If you love one another. And then uh, I, and then I go look over it like in, uh, I'm not going to read through all this because of time. But in Acts chapter 2, we're talking about in Acts chapter 4 also, we see what happened when people get preached a message. We see that uh, in Acts chapter 2, he preaches a message, and it's a hard message. It's really harsh. And, and, but what it did is it pricked their heart. And they said, what, what must we do? He said, you got to repent. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, and you shall be saved. And also, what happened at the end of that chapter is the same thing that happened in chapter 4. After those 3,000 men were saved, and in chapter 4, 5,000 men were saved, they were not commanded to do this, but this is what the body of Christ did. They went off and sold everything that they had, and they spread it amongst everybody to make sure everybody was equal and nobody was without anything. Okay? And then I'm starting to say, well, why is it? Uh, I know that I've been places in here. I've been helped many times when I need help. I help and stuff like that. But then you start saying, okay, they wasn't even commanded to do that. This is something they did after they repented and said they believed in Jesus. We're talking about 8,000 people and their actions already showed something different than what they did before. They wanted to make sure everybody was equal. They wanted to make sure nobody was doing without. It was because love. It was, they were driven to do something that they wasn't even but commanded to do by Jesus. But their actions showed that there was already change within their heart. And I'm like, why did they have this change? And then we we'll start reading. You start reading about the power of the Holy Ghost on Peter. And you, you see how Peter was preaching and he had the Holy Ghost with power. And what happens? 3,000 people get saved. Okay? And then... People start doing something different. There's actually something different in chapter four. Now, now they what happened? They go in, in chapter three and they they uh, heal a man, and of course, you know, they get uh, uh, taken uh, by the uh, uh, Pharisees and uh, uh, Sadducees or whatever, and they got told not to do it anymore. Um, don't speak the name of Jesus. And they said, well, you know, who are we going to listen to? You're God. We're going to obey God. So, you know, they got reprimanded, but it didn't do nothing. They went out and they preached, and then 5,000 more people get saved. But see, I noticed something in those chapters. It talks about the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost. When I, I brought a kid in here back in 2013 that I was coaching, a little bitty kid, and uh, he heard the word Holy Ghost a whole bunch, right? We got in the car, we left, he said, what's the Holy Ghost? And... I knew exactly what he was talking about. I grew up in a church, and I never heard the Holy Ghost mentioned. That I can't remember, not even once. I couldn't remember none of that. I could only remember being told, you know, about living life good, helping, you know, and stuff like that, but no power or nothing, no turning away from sin, just getting baptized in water. And we, we take bits and pieces of the Word of God, but when we see the power of the Holy Ghost actually work, Things were actually working in people's hearts. Things were changing in them. And see, even when they was reprimanded, what did they do? They went and they prayed. They prayed for power of the Holy Ghost. They prayed for the power of the Holy Ghost. And see, what, what I noticed um, in, in a big hole, uh, like in uh, 1 John chapter 4, it talks about, uh, I'm going to go over there. It says, um, 
I'll start out in verse uh, 6. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth us not. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another. For love comes of God. And everyone that loves is born of God and knows God. All right, I'm going to stop right there and I'm going to draw a picture. The other day we were going down the road. Uh, baby girl sits behind me. Malachi sits behind my wife. And we're going down the road and I smell something. It's really strong. Something like, I'm like, what? And so I look over there. I, Malachi is always guilty. But this time I look at him immediately. He's not guilty. He's just sitting there and nothing. So I kind of look around that seat, and I see baby girl's hand coming up like this, back up toward her mouth, and I see brown stuff all over her hand. And I was like, oh, my! And I was like, stop! And I reach back there, and I'm cramping and everything, trying to hold her little hand, trying to keep it from going back in her mouth because she had been sticking it in her mouth. And she pulls over and says, what is it? And I said, it's... But anyway, it's poop, and... uh this is serious, right? And then she jumps out of the car, and I'm like, come open that door, open my door. And I wait till she gets her hand on there to keep her from putting her hand in her mouth, right? So, and, the re- and I, I wait for her to do that because I don't want her sticking her hand back in her mouth because I know this can hurt her. But she's happy as a lark. It's not, it ain't bothering her. She's got poop in her mouth. She don't care. She's smiling, laughing. She don't know that it could damage her. She doesn't know the trouble that she could be in. And so I get over there, and we got Maggie in the back. She don't want no part of it. We're like, hey, pull out some diaper wipes now. Hurry. And uh, Michelle and I, we get her on the side of the road, hanging this baby in the air, you know, cleaning her up, getting all this poop off of her. What made me do that? Love, love, it was an action. Love is an action word. A lot of people say they love, but they have no actions to follow. And Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey me. You say you love Jesus, and you have no actions to follow. You're lying. If your actions are not following And doing what Jesus says, you are a liar, and there is no love for Christ within you. Because if you meet Jesus Christ, the Jesus of the Bible, and he puts a spirit within you that causes you to love, you're going to follow. And that may not be perfectly, but your desires are going to be to follow. I could have just left her there like many people do. At the end of this chapter, it says, If any man say, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. Okay. Now, we think of hate. Like when I was growing up, I didn't like this guy. I didn't like that guy. But I'm going to say with God, it's a little bit different. If you're not telling them about him, I say you hate him already. Why do you hate somebody so much that you won't tell them about his son? You say that you believe in Jesus Christ. You say you believe in Jesus Christ, and you won't even tell the next person about Jesus. What have they done so wrong to you? Do you look at them any different? Do you may, are you a respecter of persons? Think about this. And this is something we should examine ourselves to. Why am I keeping my mouth shut? That's what the devil would want. Why am I not going to tell them about Jesus if I love Jesus? I think about in the book of Luke where it says, don't turn your hand or don't take your hand off the plow. Don't look back. This hits kind of home to me that we got to stay the course. And the reason we got to stay the course is we got people in our life that if we ever turn, they're not ever, if they see that we're fake, we're phony, that if it ain't real, that if we're willing to give in to what they, I'm going to tell you personally, I have two children that say they're homosexuals. And I have had a conversation with both of them by text because one of them won't talk to me on the phone no more. And uh, I just let them know, look, if he was a a fornicator, a liar, uh, a thief, I would tell you the same message. But I'm not going to accept because, they see, they think love is acceptance. That's where I'm going with this. 
They think love is acceptance. And I said, no, I will not accept you going to hell. I won't accept it. So I'm going to keep my hand on the plow and keep going forward. And if you don't come, even if you don't come, I'm still keeping my hand on the plow and I'm going to go forward. If you so choose to turn your back and keep your back turned on Jesus Christ, then so be it. But if I don't keep going that way, I can never lead somebody in a direction I'm not going. So i got to keep going that way. It's the love of God that compels me to tell them the truth. It's real easy for me to go into places where I don't know people, go into prisons, preach against homosexuality, and what do they do? They come down to the altar afterward and they say, look, I've been walking in homosexuality for 15 years. I want to repent. I want to turn away from it. I've seen it happen time and time again. And why is it they say they've been going to church all these times, but they ain't ever heard their message? Just this last Sunday we went in. And there was some guys that looked like women straight. I I was like, one of them, I was like, that is really a woman. I would have fooled me in the world. I'm not kidding. Now, one of them couldn't handle it. They said, got up and walked out. But they heard the truth. Is that love? It absolutely is. You don't leave them in their crap, so to say. You don't leave them in their sin. You got to tell them. You might get a little on you. They might, they might come against you. But we ain't ever been locked up for preaching the gospel. And I ain't been beat for preaching the gospel. Nobody's ever punched me through a text or punched me through the phone. Nobody's punched me in person. Nobody's done any of that. So where does this fear come in that stops me from doing what God tells us all to do? He don't tell everybody that they're going to be behind the pulpit. But there's people in your life that you see daily. And you know or not walking after Jesus. Why do you keep your mouth shut? Look, I preach this because I ask myself this. Why did I not say nothing earlier? Why did I not say nothing to that guy? I get convicted over it. When I read the Word of God, I get convicted because I'm supposed to be different. There's something within me that is different. All right. I think of the rich young ruler when he come to Jesus. And I'm going to say this a little different. I know he led him to the law or whatever, but then he said, hey, um, he said, I've kept all those since a child. And then he tried to show him that he has already broken the first and second commandment anyway, and he didn't know it, but there was something greater on his heart he didn't want to let go of. But when I read that, and like I said, I examined myself to the scriptures. I said, I asked myself, is there anything within me that I have not laid down to do what Christ has called me to do? Is there anything? And I'm going to ask you this right now. Is there anything that you've not laid down? Truly. Because I can't watch all of you and I can't follow you around. But Jesus sees everything. I heard Ronnie say in a message one time when he was preaching to some kids because that's what he does. He's a good example. He goes into his workplace and, and that, well, that example was you don't want to do anything in front of your pastor or somebody else in the church, but you do it in front of Jesus. Another good example, I'll go to eat the other day and this girl said, hey, I want to do Paradise School, you know, we was talking to her. I was about to minister the gospel to her. And then she says, oh, uh, my wife said, do you know Ronnie Shelby? He's like, yeah, all he did was preach <laughs> in the classroom. We didn't really, all we learned about the gospel, that's what she said. And, I mean, I was like, well, praise God. That's a good example. I see good examples within churches of people helping, laying down their time to go help people. I've seen examples of love. I see examples of things. And I'm not telling you the Bible's telling you go sell off everything you have, but what is it that's, that you have that's got you, that you're not willing to let go for something that Jesus is telling you to do? You see what I'm saying? They were willing to let everything go to go serve Jesus. But here in this country, we've become a people of stuff. And, and and we we become a in in the that's why we like the gospel that preaches about Jesus is here to give you stuff. 
But that's not why he moved in your heart and gave you a new heart and put a spirit within you. You know, in the Bible, it says he gives the Holy Ghost to those that believe. But in the book of Acts, it says he gives the Holy Ghost to those that obey him. And that's what believe means. So there's a reason. And this is going to draw a conclusion here. If there's no power in your life, and you're not doing anything that God's telling you to do, it's the Holy Ghost within you. He says he gives it to those that obey him. And without him, as he says he gives it to those who believe. Is there any power within your life to walk out what Jesus says to walk out? And if there's not, you need to be honest with yourself. Quit lying to yourself. Jesus is all-powerful, almighty. And there, whenever you come to him, things change. Your whole desires change. I didn't care if anybody else was going to heaven after I repeated them prayers. I didn't even care to read the Bible every day. I didn't care to talk about Jesus. That's many people's lives. They come to church. But when they leave, they don't talk about the word. The enemy's done snatched it out of them. They go on living their life until the next time they go to church. Church should be coming together. To All scripture is there to reprove, rebuke, correct, exhort. All scripture. But we, but, but we as people like to take bits and pieces out of it. But I'm going to tell you, if you don't have the Holy Spirit within you, you're not born again and saved. Because he gives that to those who believe. And if you say you believe, you will obey. And we don't do it perfectly. But you need to examine yourselves. Examine yourselves to what you do out there, outside these walls. It's real easy to come together and for us to say, we, hey, I love you, I love you, but what happens when we go outside these walls? Do you do anything for anybody else? Do you? Do you tell anybody about the one that you say you love? If you don't, I pray that you start. I pray that you repent. All right? That's all I got. Praise the Lord. You know, one of my favorite things about coming up here is how, like, every time the Lord gives me a word, he gives the exact same one to everyone else, too. So, I kid you not, every time I come up here, usually there's a couple of people that end up speaking, and I start cringing every time I do, because I'm like, don't steal my verse. Don't steal my verse. Rick started talking about uh, how we act in certain situations, and Clayton starts talking about uh, really just what we do, what we do in our lives, and, and how we walk this thing out as a believer. And if we're not walking anything out, then there's nothing there. So I also am going to be talking about uh, walking in the character of Christ. All right? So... I got cutting down by like half, but I started asking myself that, like, uh, like Clayton was saying, what does it look like, what does it actually look like every single day to walk in the character of Christ? And so, I'm really glad Clayton preached what he did because I can't say it's not important. You have like the big things, you know, like the, the preaching the gospel, the, the being bold enough in your workplace to, to call out what you see. The, uh, the loving your neighbor as yourself. But the way I was thinking about this, whenever you talk about the character of Christ, you can take this any direction you want and you can go for hours. Because when you talk about the attributes and the character of Christ, it's never ending. And we, we as far as we can run, we never get close. That's how we measure, but when how far and how great the ways of Christ are compared to our ways. But I got to thinking about the small things. The small things every single day that we either do or don't do. We either address or don't address. We either change or we don't change. 
And so I have some foundational scriptures, like uh, like Clayton was saying, talking about the banana. Is God working on the inside of you and changing you every single day? Is that happening? And like he said, examine yourself. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians, I think it's 13, 5, examine yourself to see if ye indeed be in the faith. So a couple of foundational scriptures, Matthew 12, 36. And it says, but I say to you that for every idle word, and I'm reading out of the New King James, if it's different from what's up there. But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give an account of it in the day of judgment. Every idle word. What is your day-to-day conversation? And I understand, like, we're not speaking Scripture 24-7, you know. (laughs) You could be. I'd like to see that. Someone asks you, what do you want to wear today? I'd like to see the answer to that in Scripture. But every idle word, the, the simple conversations we have, what does that look like? 2 Corinthians 5.10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. John 15.4. Actually, I'm going I'm to talk about those two scriptures real quick. So the Bible, if you read through scripture, it will address every area of your life that needs to change. There isn't a single area in our lives that Scripture doesn't address. Not a single one. Right here, it's talking about how we speak. The next verse is talking about what we do day to day. In John 15, 4, Jesus said, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. So when Christ comes in and abides on the inside of us, what, what that means is that he's going to change the very fabric of who we are. When Christ is on the inside, there's no area that he's not going to touch in our life. There's, there's, no, there's no door he's going to leave closed because he doesn't want to address it. There's no shadow that he's not going to light up. Everything the Lord wants to change in our life. So I'm going I'm to go here. So I want to talk about small things. Jesus said it like this. It's the small foxes that spoil the vine. Small things. The things that we, we don't see. Think about a, a vineyard. If you have a field full of vines, you don't necessarily see the little fox. But you can see the damage that it does when you go back and you look through. So I want to go. Uh, I want to go to Philippians two fourteen and five. So the question that I have is, how do you handle and how do you respond to situations? And what I got to thinking about is just like Clayton, God uses the stuff that I go through in life, and He shows me stuff in His Word, and then I get convicted about it. So the reason that I felt led to talk about this is because, as you guys know, we have a another beautiful baby that the Lord has given us. Amen? But with that, I completely forgot about how frustrated I get and how quickly I can get frustrated and upset. So the question is, how do we respond to situations in our life? For instance, when we get upset, talk to husbands, when we get upset, does our wife become our punching bag? Because we're upset. Maybe you're not married in. Your kids become the one that you, you unload on because you're frustrated. How about your coworkers? If things aren't going the way they should be on the job, you then turn to everyone else and make them feel like they're walking on, on, on ice, thin ice. So how do we handle situations that come up in our life, and are we handling them the way that Christ would have us to handle them, or are we acting out in the flesh? So Philippians 2, 14 and 15, it says, Do all things without complaining, that you may become blameless and harmless children of God, without fault 
in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Clayton just said that we're supposed to be supposed to be peculiar. And not only that, to the world, how the Christian handles the situation should seem odd. They shouldn't understand how we're able to do what we do, how we're able to address situations, we address them, but we know why. And it's like Clayton said, because the Spirit of God lives on the inside of us. So do things without complaining. I just, uh, so in the middle of the night, you got a crying baby. They might have gone to the bathroom and might be hungry. And so we laugh about it in the morning. We don't in the middle of the night, but Bailey, Bailey will ask me, like, hey, will you get a diaper? Hey, will you go make sure the door is locked? And so, like, about, like, the 10th or 11th question, like, it's one of those things where I don't just get out of bed. I'm like, yes, with the covers. And I'm like, ah. And then she gets frustrated and she gets upset. And we laugh about it in the morning, but then I start thinking, probably not the best way to handle that situation. Now I, now I know. <laughs> but it's, it's little things like that. See, there are situations in our life that we cannot control. We cannot control how everyone else speaks to us. We cannot control what everyone else does to us. We cannot control how much pressure we're put under in this world. But the one thing we can control is how much like Christ we're going to be in the midst of all of that. So Ephesians 4, uh, chapter 4, verse 31 and 32. The Bible says, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking, let it be put away from you with all malice. And instead, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Amen. Let all bitterness, let all wrath. And so I'm talking about the, the way we handle situations in our life. Are we doing what the Bible would consider to walking in the flesh? Or are we doing the latter part, which is walking in the spirit? Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. Which one are we doing? And even more importantly, which one are we consistently doing? It's great if you can handle a situation one time, one day, out of the seven days of the week, out of the 30 days of the month, and out of the 12 months of the year. Bless God, you handled that one situation right. But what about all the others? It's not enough just to have one good day. Our lives are to be marked by holiness and righteousness in the character of Christ every single day that we get up out of, the, out of our beds. And go with me over to Romans chapter 6. We're going to start in verse 4. And the other great thing about, uh, about God's word is that God gets rid of any excuse we might come up with. Every single one. If you think you came up with a good one, crack open that Bible again. So uh, chapter 6, verse 4. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And that newness of life is newness of absolutely everything. It's not just that you used to do drugs and you don't anymore. It's not that you used to be an alcoholic and you're not anymore. It's that your attitude's changed. The way you think has changed. The way you speak has changed. How you handle the relationships you have with your family. If you were lazy before you got saved, you ought to be the hardest worker afterwards. Walking in newness of life. And so many times we allow the old man to go ahead and come along with us after we meet the Lord. And we don't, we don't crucify it like the Bible says. Uh, verse 5. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. 
Jesus' words. How many of us have ever heard, I just can't seem to stop? I just can't help myself. I just can't seem to lay it down. My God says that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Which means that the words of my God overpower what I feel. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. And this is where I want to get. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Verse 12, therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lusts. Verse 13, and do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. So three verses back to back, Paul tells us that we have a responsibility in denying what it is that raises up in our flesh. First one in verse 11, reckon yourselves. Reckon yourselves. That means that, that, means that you declare yourself to be dead to sin. Instead of constantly saying, I'm never going to get over this sin, instead of constantly saying, I'm never going to get past this thing, the Bible says to reckon it dead. And that doesn't mean that the flesh doesn't rise up. Uh, that's my kid. Yeah, I know that cry. That one's mine. Got off. So yeah, reckon yourselves. Reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Verse 12, do not let sin Reign in your mortal body. And reign means whatever reigns, that's the established ruler. Don't let sin be the established ruler in your body. And if we go back to the small things, when the flesh rises up, and it doesn't matter what it is, we can go to Galatians and, and see the works of the flesh. Even though Paul said it like this, he says, I see a law in my members that even when I desire to do good, evil is present with me. So the Bible acknowledges that even in our fighting and even in our desiring to do good, there's always this evil in the flesh that seems to rise up. But Paul says here, don't let that reign. Choose. So for people that say, I just can't seem to stop. I'm going to challenge it and say that you don't want to. And that upsets the person that doesn't want to change. And that upsets the person that finds excuses to remain the way they are. But my Bible says otherwise. So it doesn't matter what I feel in my flesh. The Bible tells me that I can overcome whatever it is. Whatever it is. And I'm talking about just the small things. If you want to hit the big things in your life, hit those two. You need to. But the small things, our attitude in the day-to-day. -day. When you wake up, are you a grouch? Are you glad that God gave you life? Verse 13. Do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead in your members as instruments of righteousness. So what we do when the flesh rises up? See, so many times we just, we just let it sit there. And we just let it marinate. Instead of addressing it. So many times we let just 
bitterness just hang out there in our hearts for, for a second too long. The moment the flesh rises up, we have to fight it with the Spirit. And we wonder why we fall prey so many times. The Bible says to lay aside every weight and hindrance that does so easily beset us, get us off course. So the big question that I was thinking to myself is how do we prepare every day to walk in the character of Christ? How do we prepare to do that? And I got to thinking about everything that we prepare for in our lives. I mean, you can think of anything. Prepare to go to work. Got to make my lunch. Got a job to do. I got to get all my materials together. I got to prepare to do this. I got to prepare to do this. I got to prepare to do this. See, we have an understanding of what it means to get prepared to do whatever it is you have to do in this life. But so many times we don't get prepared to walk in the character of Christ for the day that's ahead of us. And then we wonder why we can't seem to walk in victory. So how do we prepare? You do that by getting ready for the day with your God. You get with God so that you are now prepared for the day. The hardest days I have are the days that I don't spend time with God. The days where I handle everything the wrong way, guess what I didn't do that morning? So if we want to walk in the character of Christ, if you want to, and if you're born again and saved, it should be your greatest desire. We also need to address these small things. Like Clayton was preaching, I hate saying that there's big things and small things because, I mean, they're all walking, walking in the character of Christ, every bit of it. But so many times we overlook the things like our attitude and the way we react, and how we treat our spouses or our children or our coworkers. We kind of push those to the side to only look at the big things, but we need, to, we need to address all of it, every bit of it. That's all I got, Sean.